it must have felt like the world was against you. Yeah, actually, I feel unfair and you're angry. And it's not just that. I told you, it's more awful than it sounds. I got kids too. And the kids, they have classmates. And I'm famous in Manila. I, I We want the world champion. We, we give, we, I, I, I'm a known person as an esports celebrity in Philippines. And then my kids, their father is like the, the world champion team in, in, in the country, which is, which is me. Red Esports, we won the M2 World Champion in Mobile Legends. And, and my, my class, my, my sons and daughters will, will be bullied by their classmates, say, hey, your father's a crook, your father's a criminal, and everything. And of course, they will defend, defend me. But it's words against words. And that's just how the society is. Welcome to Beyond the File the podcast where we talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about their biggest business failures. We'll deep dive into how they overcame these setbacks, the lessons they learned from them, all to help you gain valuable insights. Failure is an essential part of the business journey, as well as being the key to success. So we're here to show you how to thrive from it. In today's episode, we're diving into the incredible journey of Bernard Chong, a heavyweight in business celebrated as a billion dollar entrepreneur, esports luminary and shrewd angel investor. Bernard's story is a saga of success. He catapulted his family's shoe business into a national stardom and founded the championship winning Bren Esports. What sets him apart is not just his ventures but also his role as a billion dollar angel investor backing projects across diverse fields like retail, fashion, food, gaming and technology. In this conversation, Bernard generously shares the wealth of experience, emphasizing crucial lessons from the early days of his business, including the challenges that his dad's shoe business went through. He also shares how he expanded Tim Hortons into 53 locations and crafting a billion dollar portfolio with strategic investments. Bernard discusses facing challenges head on, the art of smart experimentation, and navigating the storm of false accusations around drug smuggling, which as a CEO of one of his investment businesses, he was pulled into and had to leave his native Philippines for over a year. His insights reflect not just the success, but the resilience and adaptability needed for the long game. So join us for an action-packed episode with Bernard Chong. It's a roller coaster, and he shares so much value and so many lessons which have made him a standout figure in the business world. So this is Beyond the Fail with Bernard Chong. Bernard, thanks for joining today and for being on the podcast. So I'm just going to dive kind of straight in because I know we're kind of limited on time. Where did it all start for you in business? Well, it started when I was young. I was raised from a family business. So I see the business practices of having a shoe store, a, a factory, in my house and to sell it. So I started when I was really young. So what influence did that give you in terms of, you know, being being surrounded by business from that early age? I saw the perks. I saw that he, uh, my father and mother, they can get what they want if they want if they want to eat if they want to buy something it kind of inspired me to beat them and they tell me the values, the the needs of, the need to manage, the need to do sales and stuff. But they tell you, but until you actually practice it, you would do it wrong the first time around. I think it's generally to all people. And also being a business owner, my father, certain stage, he was successful and he grew it in a bigger stage now. And because it's his first time too, then the business failed also. All and right. then he learned his lesson. And now we redid it with my brother. And now we're, we're the biggest uh, local shoe brand in Manila. And of course, it's, it's really new to people on certain stages when, when you your success on a certain standpoint of, mm. of size, but when you're big size, you have to change how you operate things. 
Yeah, you mean that there's there's yeah there's different iterations of business depending on 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 your size and um you know I've heard that said that you know every sort of I don't know ten or twenty employees you essentially need to generate a um a new set of processes and everything like that and obviously when you start getting to the hundreds and the thousands it will be the same because what works for 10 people won't work for a thousand employees yes yes and just to give some context i suppose when you're when you were a child and your family you know was surrounded by business what was the business they were involved with and what kind of size was it at when we were young i think our employee employee Employees were like 60 people, right. worker and marketing and sales. And now I think the shoe company employs 600, 600 right, well. 500 people. And that's just the shoe business. Right, yeah, of course. And did you feel any pressure to follow in your footsteps of, of your family into that business? No pressure. They didn't really tell me that I must do this stuff. They just let me be. But I just want to be a businessman. And I did try also to be an engineer because that's what I studied. Right. But I found out that the pay of a newly grad, I could out earn it through business and through mm -hmm. sales. So I decided to do the business and sales path. Did you have any businesses yourself when you were younger you know like i don't know selling sweets at school or anything like that did you ever were, was there that entrepreneurial drive when you were younger yeah the first business after i graduate was i was buying aluminum used aluminum cans on a restaurant and schools so i would i would buy it i, w I would wait it i would tell people that i'm buying it but through weight and in according to pounds there's a certain amount that I would collect it. So I would go at the night shift before the store closes or when the school ends and at night when the janitor are done with their crack mm. and I would go them with my truck and I would get them and, and wait them and, and buy it to them because I know a melting machine that will buy it from me at a higher price. So that's the first business I started. And how old were you then? I was like 22 years old. Okay. And what happened to that business? Well, it made money, but I I didn't plan it to be scalable because I was just newly grad that time. And I don't have a warehouse where I could dump all the things. Plus, I didn't compute that. If it's just a street where there's a restaurant, then it's good. But if you're going to go to the other street, the gasoline costs mm. because at first my family would lend me the truck and would lend me gasoline so everything was free so mm. I was I, it feels like you're making mud even if you wash the cats before you sell it because you have to wash it you feel like every resource is free so you make money but when you say it's going to start a business and then you're going to mm. count the gasoline you can count the water you get out the rent space then suddenly it's not worth the effort if it's like small scale so I stop it. So the first lesson of failure there, well, it's not really failure, but I tried it without planning and everything was free. So I was doing it, but in an actual thing where you count the costs and mm. I didn't count it. So it wasn't realist. Right. So the yeah. first thing a person should do is to be real and really count everything before they, they try stuff. But that sounds like that was a good testing ground for you to experiment in, in essentially having your own business. Like, what did you, what else did you learn from that experience? Well, I learned to talk to people. I learned to negotiate prices. I learned to negotiate uh, a lower a lower price when you're buying and a higher price when you're selling. And of course, uh, you see people. Some people just give the trash free. You know, it's like, hey, we mm. didn't throw it in the restaurant. It's for you free. So you learn. Good, you meet good people too, mm. and you meet people who also, when they found out that you're selling it, they would not give it to you, and they will sell them themselves too to make the profit. To say if this is from the restaurant and it's really you're selling, it, I'm gonna sell it instead of giving it to you. So you meet all kinds of people there, 
when you do business. So when you do business, you meet all kinds of people, good, bad, and you learn sales. No, definitely. And um, as I said, it sounds like a great sort of testing ground, particularly at the kind of young age to have those experiences and obviously support from your family. Was was your family supportive of you becoming an entrepreneur? Yes. Uh, we uh, we grew up with a close family. Means in a, in a one place of family, my grandpa, my grandma, my father, my Bro- my uncles, my brothers, bro- my father's brothers, and their families are all in one floor. If it's if like that, you you normally let them be. You let them be so they can grow and they can find their own path. And at night time or after work, you go together and you exchange notes, you exchange stories. So I was more open minded, and we were all open minded because that was how we grew up. But you said that you saw your dad's business fail. And I suppose also you must have seen the difficulties of, of business, the stress, the 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 pressure that, that he was under, or didn't he show that? You, you will see it. You know, you can't hide it. A failure, you could see. No. So our shoe brand started 1969, like close, close, to, close to 70. And we were making money until 1990s. But 1990s, 1990s, the dollar exchange changed. And we were expanding because we were successful. We opened a factory and we overpaid the construction. Like it's over, over strong and superior because we're planning for a successful, even though we're not big yet, like, for example, we grow to 200 and we're planning to grow to 500, even though we're not 500. Yeah. We plan for a 500 uh, space mm. and structure. So overspending because of success that leads to failure because of overconfidence and poor planning. So what, so what happened? How did that, what did that kind of story look like in terms of that? That, yeah. that failure of that business. It was the first time we were going to export shoes in Korea. And we were confident because they would pay first when before they make us produce. And when we were producing export quality, we didn't know that the, qual- the standards were so rigid. And the timing is also rigid. So doing a, a contract to foreigner, first time. And you have no experience and you're learning it. And you're learning to mass produce the first time. Mm. That's like a measure of all red lights, all first time, all new. It's like it's like very clear that you're gonna fail. And from there, our family had a hard time, really, really hard time, almost bankrupt. So I saw firsthand that when you're small and you dream something big and you're not used to it. There's going to be a struggle to be bigger. And if you couldn't push through with it, if you can't figure it out, you will fail. And then you will have to start again and probably redo it like my elder brother did now. And when we do it, with all the lessons of my father and the past experiences, we are now really the biggest local shoe brand in Manila. But it got through failure. So what were the lessons that you took from that experience? Well, those times we didn't hire the right people. The same uh, people who managed the small company when it was big, there were there were their posts and their style was the same. Their their management style was the same. Their timing was the same. But uh, producing 100, 100 pairs of shoes to producing five thousand pairs of shoes, you should have a different. Uh, system so all those cost money real money and we learn we learn to 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 put people the right people to to apply good system to hire uh corporate people from foreign foreign factories to te- teach us how they do it there are yeah. styles and we didn't know 
that's really interesting because I'm actually reading the book Who Not How at the moment, and it, it, that's essentially it says exactly I, the I, same I thing. Read that book, and now I tell to people also. There's a lot of people who have done it, and if you're doing a certain journey, look for that person and then ask that person to do the journey with you, or ask them because they're really wanting to share. And the Who Not How is very important, shortcut mm. to to things to how to get things done. And you mentioned that had an impact, that failure had an impact on your family and you nearly went bankrupt. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? I mean, given that you were such a tight knit family, you know, that must have had challenges and, and that must have been quite a difficult period. Oh, yes. In this, in real life, there are only two, I mean, with money, there are two things that you fight with money. Too much money and no money. <laughs> and okay. the other said when it was background, then it's no money. So you kind of see the pressure who, who, how will you eat first? Will you expand first? Will you pay the debt of factory first? And of course, people have different mindset because some people will say that you have to pay first. Some people say, no, eat first before pay. So at the end of the day, it's the person's a business who's the leader is it's his call what to do if he feels like he can plant the money and grow first and not pay first it is what it is and I, I feel like in, in, in the system is in place where whatever happens there's a system how to fix certain stuff there's law how to fix debt there's law how to fix bankruptcy there is law how to fix on everything you just have to deal with it and know it so what decision did your, well, I presume your father was in charge then, was he? Yes, my father was so in charge. What decision did he make? It, of course, to move on, move forward, to to continue the brand. So what we did was we find someone who will finance the brand and we will get royalty of the brand. Wow. For a certain year, uh, we were earning from the royalty only. So you weren't doing the manufacturing? We weren't doing the manufacturing. Mm. Did you close that factory then? Yes. Mm. In force close. And right. we were just feeding off royalty until it was a struggle because from manufacturing and earning a lot of income margin because it's in your hands. Now you just have a certain amount of value per pair and that's just because they're using your brand. And it took us like eight years to to recoup and to really mm. save and to finish all the studies and everything because it's in in actual life it's not just recouping the brand money because you have to feed the family you have to pay the electricity you have to pay rent and then you have to you know send people to school hospital accidents you mm. have to take care of it so it's really not hard and plan to expand and no financial institution will also back you up when you're when you're down yep. so it was really a struggle that time all those prepared all those hardship prepared us to be strong and wise how old were you at the time when this happened this was like uh during 1990s so i was like 14 15 years old all right i would also say that most successful businesses have gone through failure i it's really seldom that a business will be a success without going through failure if the business becomes successful and didn't go through failure, mm. eventually a hardship is coming, a uh, mm. challenge is coming because that's just the cycle and nature of learning and that's the nature also of success. No, absolutely. Um, what You said you were 14 when that happened. Did you understand the significance of everything that was going on around you? Yes, because you would feel the fight, you will feel that there's no food. You will feel people talking, saying stuff that sometimes you you were eating and they say, oh, what you're eating is our our money or other people's money. You know, some people are harsh and stuff. So you kind of like really, even though you can't react, you were young, you don't know if it's true or not or something, but you know that's not right. That's not supposed to be heard. So you all 
where like your brain is supposed to open, your senses are supposed to open, and you realize like, oh, it, this is the real world. This is this is this is how it is in real. Sounds a very yeah kind of harsh environment to be kind of growing up in in that in that time. Yeah. No, uh, from success to bottom, mm. you because you know all the lesson trees when you're success. So when you're at the bottom, you know that all these present trees are nowhere to be found. Mm. So you would know. It's different between if you're not successful and you haven't achieved success, you feel, you feel like it's normal. But change off from pleasantries to, to no pleasantries, you would feel it. And how did your dad and family get through that that period? I remember we're having a family meeting and we're also discussing if we're going to continue or not or we just lay flat and just do uh, certain things. But I had a discussion with my father and he said, all the momentum or all the hardships through the years has been planted already, like the brand. And if you're going to destroy the brand or sell the brand and you're going to make another brand again, it's so hard. So we really up decided to continue it, even though it's hard. It's like when he particularly said, if like you lift a table that's heavy and maintaining lifting it is easier than dropping it and then lifting it again. Mm. That's I remember the exact words. That's what he said to me. Mm, that's a good analogy. So this experience, obviously at a young age, which is quite a formative age, 14, 15, that didn't put you off going into business? I know. Because I studied in a Chinese school, Grace Christian High School, where I graduated. And we were all, uh, my classmates were all business people, business families. And I can see their success. So I think, I'm blessed also that I'm surrounded with good energy, even though trials are there. I'm surrounded with good people also. And it's not good that they're overly good. It's good in the sense that they're enduring this similarly heavy hard time. They're talking about their own business problems and how they're solving it. Mm. I was immense in those uh, surroundings that people are always problem solving, pra discussing open to discussing their own problem and asking. So it imprinted in me too that I would like to solve other people's problem too if I can. I want to be better and so that if I talk to people and they have problems, I could suggest things how to solve them. I could tell stories that this happened and how to solve them. Is that how you see business? Do you see it as essentially one big process of problem solving? Yes. Actually, business is Making value, solving problems. Can that can be your problem or can be the world's problem or a community problem or a system systematic problem or you're improving something, but it is solving some sort of uh, backward thing or a problem. And it's so interesting that you had the entrepreneurial family you know, surrounded by business and then you went to school and you were surrounded by other businesses and other business families. So I, it's not really a surprise that you went into business, but there was never any doubts that that was what you wanted to do. I know you said you, you kind of went down the engineering path, but was it always in your mind that you would become a business owner, an entrepreneur? Yes. When I was young, it's really not clear. I tried to be an employee. Like I, I graduated an electronics communication engineering in De La Salle University, Manila Taft. And but again, of course, I was doing sales also, selling our shoe brand to co-workers, uh, co co student and to their families. So when I found out that newly newly grad pay of a newly engineer, I can outdo them by say by selling shoes. I can outdo mm. So maybe it's just the universe was perfect for me to go to the path of entrepreneurship. And how was the experience of being an employee? 
and employee and OJT, it was okay. I, I I do follow. I I was employed to Sony Ericsson Philippines. I was uh, installing antennas and cell site. Right. And that that's 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 part of the job as an engineer, electronics engineer, and as a a new guy, you help in a team. Mm-hmm. So it was labored labored work, and it's okay. It's a specialized thing. But then again, uh, sometimes to all people, the universe has a plan. You have your plan, and the universe has a plan for you. If you're sensitive enough, I think the universe plan is always better than your plan. And what did you think the universe's plan was for you? Well, it was planned for me to be a businessman, to be an mm. angel investor, to help people to to learn. And and this is what happened in my life. Mm. So so I think it's still I'm just attuned and following the plan, the mm. the natural flow. I really sometimes when you're successful, you feel like all right, you're going to be sturdy and not move and you're going to maintain everything as is. And then in your life, there would be circumstances that would be unknown to you, blindsided you and say, this happens and you don't understand why, but at the end of it, you're in a better place. So the actual experience is like, I was well off in my country. I don't need to go out. I feel like I'm okay there, but it's a third world place, Philippines. But and then suddenly I was accused of something where I was, you know, forced not to, I was traveling and I was not forced not to come back because I was accused, wrongfully accused. And that's a perfect thing for the universe. And I overthink myself that time and I thought, I don't know what to do. I was thinking what to, the right thing to do, but it was new to me and I was, I was surprised. And that, this was like two years ago and mm. now it's dismissed it's clear mm. that experience nothing bad happened to me except that I was forced to be not in my comfort zone be in a first world country and mingle with people in a first world country and and learn stuff and, and mm. now those that thing I think was a blessing instead mm. of a curse well it's it was a curse because I was shaken up and a lot of you know, bad and stuff and names were ruined. But again, it proves that you can start somewhere and you can deal with good people and you still be okay. What I mean is like, if you're complaining and you feel like you're not doing anything, someone will just start tomorrow with nothing. Mm. Will 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 meet people, will have a good plan. And after five years, that person will be successful probably a billionaire, a millionaire, or at least a well-off person. And why can't that be you? If even if you got started from nothing. Mm. That's just my mindset. Mm. The This accusation, which I know um, you know, we wanted to kind of touch on, um, do you want to say a little bit more about the details of, of that for, for, for people that don't know? And then I would, I would kind of quite like to explore what impact that had on your businesses. Like I said, circumstantial. It's like I put a company on a processing company, processing that process papers. And there's a shipment of illegal stuff that went through. And when the court decides to to investigate it, they will investigate the whole thing. So during that investigation, every name in the paper must be at least be be there until proven innocent. Mm-hmm. And that that was the case. So because mm. it was a shipment it was a shipment of, of, of drugs, wasn't it? That's that's what the uh, the uh, the uh, the reports say. A forwarding company that processed the papers. So you had in you that was your company, you invested in it, was it? The shipment I, company. I put money there. Yeah. Okay. So so again, it's like you own the land you rent it on the person and then that person who rented it, let's say, make uh, drugs in the place. Mm. So when an investigation is going to take place, of course, the landowner is going to be investigated and then the renter is going to investigate, something like that. So there, when the shipment was there, the the forwarding company that processed the papers, which is my part, 
was was there and then the the cargo the one that owns the cargo everything will be there and investigate it until it gets sorted out and my lesson here is uh, just believe in the justice system it works just just it just takes time because they're sorting mm-hmm. it, it and and it was a painful experience for me it was really hard and it's good that there's a system on step by step process on how to do it so you just follow it so that did that mean that you couldn't go back to the philippines and you had to live somewhere well, else well it's not that i can't go back but because it was new to me i didn't decided to go back hmm. i didn't decided to go back because it's unknown i haven't I don't know. It's my first time. I mm. didn't know, so I was overthinking, and it it's good thing that I got counsel who really told me what to do. It just I didn't change my number, my number back then, and I was accused. I didn't change it, and until now it's the same number that I have. Mm. Email I didn't choose. I didn't change any communication because I'm confident that that's that's also my my way of saying, if you're going to investigate me, here's the number. Here's the mm-hmm. number since I was, I, this is 20 years ago until now, so you could check everything and see everything rather than getting rid of that number. So, I, And how long did that process go on for from the accusation to it, you being acquitted? Two years. Two, three. Wow. Three, three years, two years. There is a, there's a system. So you, they, they can't clear it out very fast. Normally, Clearing something very fast means maybe maybe some magic happens. But with mine, I really made the, the time, the process. And what was the lowest point in that three years? The lowest point is in our system when you're you have a bad rap in the news, the ba- the ba- the banking financial institution will cut your your banking your banking lines or or record or the bank they'll kick you off they close your account and you cannot blame them with them they have so many clients and they cannot be harboring a bad person so they'll just cut you off rather than be also say I have a bad rep that they're catering for bad people you know so that's hard because I really feel like if it is just the news the system should be guilty before deemed before giving them penalties. But mm-hmm. sadly, our world system is not like that. Our world system is if you just have a bad name in the news media, they will really cut you off. And of course, it was hard for me. Good thing I got good friends who helped me. I also remember uh, all those people who helped me, who gave me place to stay, you know, give me food to eat, you know, sometimes they teach me stuff to what to do. Uh, uh, it, it will always be with me. And as I grow, I will always look up to them. I mean, that sounds an incredibly difficult period. You know, you've been accused of something really serious that's then, you know, made the media and it's essentially starting to affect your reputation and then your, your lines of credit are cut. How, how did all of that feel to you? It must have felt like the world was against you. Yeah, actually, I feel unfair and you're angry. And it's not just that. I told you, it's more awful than it sounds. I got kids too. And the kids, they have classmates. And I'm famous in Manila. I, I, we won the world champion. We, we give, we, I, I, I'm a known person as an esports celebrity in Philippines. And then my kids, their father is like the, the world champion team in, in, in the country, which is, which is me. Brand Esports, we won the M2 World Champion in Mobile Legends, and and my my class, my my sons and daughters will will be bullied by their classmates. Say, hey, your father is a crook, your father is a criminal, and everything. And of course, they will defend defend me, but it's words against words, and that's just how the society is. They say like, they didn't live with my father. My father's not like that. My father's a good person, and of course. My circle, those who know me know what kind of person I am. They would speak for me. But comparing to the news, 
and the reach of the media news and the reach of the internet it's like it's it's like battling something really plentiful versus few and of course you know how it is so words when they come out they feel like that's the truth whether it's that so responsible media is also at fault and if you really think of it uh I think news should be careful also on what they're written because sometimes they just written out of getting the views and mm. they don't know the effect of the person, how they destroy mm. the person. If it's just for their benefit of getting views, mm. like they would say, Manhattan. I was not Manhattan. But there were news that say, I was Manhattan. And that's not true because I didn't change number. I was in U.S. territory and you can't hide anything in U.S. Everything's mm. known here. So if you're really a pro or a criminal, you're not you're not here. You can't be here. And I think that's probably the most difficult thing to take, right? When you're when those kind of things start to affect your family and your kids. And that must be or, mm. Yes, that's hard. Because that's in a way personal of course. But looking now, reflecting on it, I feel like my kids did learn that this is the system as young as they are. So maybe they're wiser, they're more careful. I I never complain. I always say, universe, I thank God. I feel like maybe I was used to go to this trial and hardship for my kids to learn now, for my other friends to learn now. It's the universe again, isn't it? Yeah. And with the, the, the banks cutting your credit, what impact did, was that business credit or bit, uh, you know lines of finance to your businesses? No, no, no. That, that lies. Uh, normally, you're just you're back. Your back was just cut. Right, right, so, right. So you have no ways to buy. You have no ways to buy in a financial system. Right. Unless somebody will help you. And given what you talked about in terms of the, you know the media and and sort of the reputational points and the fact that it went on for three years. What impact did that have on your businesses? Well, I trusted my businesses to my partners. Of course, some partners, I I don't know, some partners also took advantage of it. Some partners remained loyal. And you, 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 you will really see the character of the person. Mm. Because some person will just say, oh, let's take your name off, but you're always here. You'll be respected. And they did. Some also say, it doesn't matter. We know you. Hey, we, we got far. We make money far. This is the the bonding and this is the energy. So let's just maintain it. But some also will take advantage of it. Like, all right, uh, we have to take you out. And then suddenly, when you're reaching to them, they say, oh, we do you have a problem? And we have a decision. And now we sold the company. You know, so... Is that yeah. what happened then? Yeah, yeah. And they sold the company. So it is what it is. But... Bottom line, my idea is like I'm experiencing and and viewing the optics of if I'm dead, this is how they run the world. This is how they run the life. This is my child I would grow up. So I feel like I'm on, on the observer view. I just feel like it could have gone worse. And at, I, at least I'm grateful I'm still alive. I can still function. I can still think. I still talk to people. I can still help. So, I'm just not a white hair. Mm, no, I mean, it's amazing that you have that mindset, that positive mindset, despite, as you said, a very unfair kind of situation. I mean, how, how, how have you got that mindset and strength? Well, I believe that if you really have a big responsibility on your shoulder and you're, you're being dependent by a lot of people, you can't be whining. I feel like whining because they don't have enough problems or they don't have serious problems or they're not up to it. But if you're up to it and it's really, really important, you will have to find a way how to solve it rather than whine it. If it's important mm. to you and you know you have to solve it, you'll be really sharp. You'll be really thinking. You'll be really asking because you, it's important that you want to solve it. Mm. And with the the kind of reputational point, because you're an angel investor, I was just wondering whether that impacted, because it was three years, essentially, until you got acquitted, 
did that then impact your ability to invest in other companies? Was there any moments where, you know, a, a company sign of rejected your investment proposal because of what was going on and the yeah. reputation in the media? Yes, yes. There are companies who say we cannot accept your money or will return your money because of, of this news. We cannot be uh, associated with you. And I understand all those. I don't take that personal. Again, I I understand that some people have have experience and they know that accusations happen and it's no big deal. And I, I thank you for all the partners that that believe in me and didn't took me off. But I also those partners who also who didn't believe in me, in my own way, I feel like maybe that's just our journey. It's not meant to move forward. Because I'm gonna go to a higher place. Maybe the universe is just cleaning me not to take them with me. So like I said, I'm not I don't complain. I can't whine. I I just go where where I can go. No, I mean, uh, yeah, that's credit to you to to be so positive about, about such a difficult sort of situation. Is there any other sort of experiences of business failure that have been really significant? Yes, actually, I could share two that's really significant. First, uh, when you put the wrong people, you put the wrong people and you miscommunicate, you miscommunicate, suddenly uh, you will fall off because the agenda is not right. So what you plan, but you didn't communicate properly how to execute the plan and then you miscommunicate and you trust them. So that's uh, one thing that's going to be sure mark of failure. So make sure you communicate and you see through. And Where did you see that? What, what what was the example there? How did that happen to you? So I have a company called Bazinga and my partner there, uh, we have, we have, uh, we have a goal supposed to be of, of doing a platform business and he used the resource on other stuff and I didn't check and in this idea he's doing the right thing and me as a founder I feel like that's not what we agreed upon but I just trusted him and he did it wrong until I, I saw in an event in a in an exhibit that that's the thing and I said that's not the thing and it was it was a miscommunication thing and relationship are maintained if you maintain communication and if you don't maintain communication uh, fall, falling apart is what naturally occurs and falling apart means you're not on the same direction so also, what would you have done to differently there? I would have made sure that I have communicated and maintained the relationship with that person but in my assessment because I meet a lot of people maybe that person wasn't worth it also to get my time. So mm. so I guess that was a lesson really made for me to be to to learn that I have to pick people who I want to grow old with properly because people that I will not give communication will probably just fail off. And how do you make that selection process? Because when you you don't always really know, do you, until you start working with someone, what they're going to be like? Well, nobody knows really what's happening in the future, but at least there's sign. If you have good energy, if the energy is like uh, similar, if your mindset are similar, if you feel like there's a good rapport, then those are probably the signs. But there are signs also that in the very first conversation, you know the aura is off, then you kind of be sensitive to it. I tell people to use their observation properly. Use use your eyes to see what they do. Use your senses to hear what how they talk, what they say, and who they're around with, who they hang around with. Most probably, you can now see if you like that person, or you want, or you like what they're saying, or you like where they're growing, where they're going, and then go with them if you want, and, or just let them be if they're not they're not similar mm -hmm. to your. Uh, attributes mm. and you mentioned about 
given too much trust is that some is have you got a recent example of that or an example where you have been burnt by giving too much trust away in a relationship yes uh when you see something at first starts right and then you feel like you're gonna go for a long time and you introduce all the people you you give resources you put the person on top ahead of everyone and then you spend time you groom you groom the person and then suddenly when the person's there you misalign and then the person is powerful and or have influence already and then suddenly we'll just cut you off because they will think that hey, I can do better without you or I don't need you anymore and of course when you did that when you give the resource to a certain person you didn't give the resource to another to a certain group mm. that's why you, a person must always be thinking that if I'm doing this I'm not doing this if I'm doing a certain good stuff I may, I may not be doing another good stuff other good stuff because time is really limited and there's law like you, you can only do certain things on a certain time so you must plan it and and I feel like everybody should grow slowly. Nobody should grow fast. If you grow fast, then okay, that's growth. But you have to maintain it. And mm. everything, the measurement of stability is time. So that's the lesson for me. I guess I should spend more time building in the long term with people who spend more time with me rather than picking a new guy girl or boy, man or woman, and then I'll speed her up by giving too much with not tested by time. So is that a, a lesson in sort of patience? Yeah, patience. I think the past three years, the lesson was patience because during the case, I know I'm innocent, but it doesn't come out until, it's done, and then until they all figured out that's patient. Recently, I was selling properties also, and it was mine. I own it, but again, I have a buyer already, but the papers, the documentation and everything, it took time to sell, mm. and it took time for the money to come in. Again, patience, and I'm doing businesses also. We have projects. We're dealing with big corporations, and the emails, the, the approval of the higher ups, mm. you all agree verbally. Mm. But then you have to get it agreed upon in written. Mm. And mm. that takes patience too. I mean, everything, everything a person is doing, patience is there. Were you not patient before? Be, yes, but when you're young, you're doing a lot of stuff. You really don't see it as patience. I'm 43, just just this year, 2000, out oh, 2024. 44 of uh, 2024. I just mm. turned 43 on December 25th. And it's just there when you will realize that's patient. Because when you're 17, 21, 25, you don't know that's patient. What you do is you're doing things. You're doing hard. And everything's new to you. So you don't see it as patient really. But if you're 40, you kind of know, oh, I did this before. I've done this mm. before. This is really, it is. Nothing mm. wrong with this. It's just we got to take our time to be patient to see it through. Yeah, it's an important lesson. So what advice would you give to listeners who might have experienced a significant setback or or failure within their business? First, see why the, why it failed. There's a, there's a reason why it failed. There's a scientific reason, a philosophical reason. There's a principle reason there. And learn it. That's first. Second, ask someone who have done what you're doing. Surely there are. Ask for their time, ask for their opinion, ask for their suggestion, and follow them. Those two are very important. So who, not how again, basically? Yes. And what about around sort of mindset? and Because and, you've obviously got a very strong, resilient and positive mindset and as we you know we've touched on that today but if someone you know is is probably 
at the beginning of their journey or not as experienced as you how what advice would you give to be able to get through it mentally i think universe or your dreams will be tested on how bad you want it every person will be tested their dreams what they want it has to be tested so you got to be have a good attitude you got to be resilient you got to be positive sometimes it's like a affirmation that you really want it too because if there's a setback and you don't want it and maybe you don't want it but if there's a setback there's a wall and you really want it and then you go through it then you know I must have really wanted it because I've gone through it and all these things that happen in a person's life are all necessary and good for a good reason fantastic so final question if you could go back in time and and stop all those failures that we've talked about today because there's been a few and 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 the setback and the and the sort of that big accusation would you wish that they hadn't happened and you hadn't experienced them at all well i wish i did it but i know for sure that if it didn't happen i would not be as wise and as confident today on how i am so because you asked that I have to be truthfully saying my opinion that all the failures, as long as it didn't kill me, I don't mind. It, I learn from it. I become a better person. I know what to teach to other people by failures, how not to do it. And I feel like I can give more to young people that I will advise on. I would say more. I would say if I did this wrong, then 10 people who I will advise, 10 people might not do the same mistake that I do. That's better. Mm. Mm. I, would rather, I would rather not change any failure mm. because to me, they help me become mm. wiser. That's it. So I've got a quick fire round. So this is short questions and short answers. Failure is? Necessary. What is your life's mission? to learn and to teach and to help. What's one piece of advice that you would want to give to other people on your deathbed? Enjoy the life experience. What's one habit that keeps you resilient? Attitude. Uh, I get attitude the answer. If you could be immortal and live forever, would you take it? No. Why not? I think the there's a sweetness on knowing that there's an ending and how you're going to appreciate everything because at the end, you're going to rest and they will continue. What's one surprising fact that not many people know about you? I'm actually strict rather than they think I don't. I, I'm, I'm, I'm that strict. I normally think of all things, but they think that I I make quick decisions, but I have a process of thinking a lot of things before I make that quick decision, but I make quick decisions. Interesting. That's a podcast, another podcast episode, just talking about that question. And is there someone you could recommend you think I should have on as a guest? Ronald Roberts, actually, from Mineski, is a good candidate. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, I'll look up Ronald. So thank you for that. So where can people find you and connect with you about it? Uh, I have a social media account, Facebook, Instagram, and I have a Brainseed, BrainseedFoundation.org also. So you can uh, connect through me there. Perfect. I'll put all that in the show notes. So um, thank you so much for being here and talking about lots of kind of difficult subjects and you know, giving so much advice to the listeners. So yeah, really appreciate your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Fail. Really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Please do subscribe to the show and leave us a review. It really does help us to grow and to reach more people. Do follow us on social media too. We're at Jeswood on Instagram and at Beyond the Fail on YouTube and also on Linktree. Thanks again and see you soon.